It's time for the Limitless Leadership Lounge in partnership with Heroes for All. Do you want to be a leader? In a constantly changing world, our emerging leaders look different, come from various backgrounds and from all different age groups. Leadership is changing and it's hard to keep up. But the good news, you can be a leader too. You can be an emerging leader. Welcome to the Limitless Leadership Lounge, a tri-generational conversation for emerging leaders. Come spend some time with us to discuss leadership from three angles. The coach, Jim Johnson. The professor, Dr. Anuma Kareem. The host, John Gehring, a monthly guest. And you. Get in on the conversation on Facebook and Instagram. And be sure to follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Spreaker. So come on in and make yourself comfortable. It's another tri-generational conversation for emerging leaders. Welcome on in to the Limitless Leadership Lounge in partnership with Dr. Anuma Kareem's organization, Heroes for All, where they're trying to help um, global emerging leaders. And hey, so are we here at the Limitless Leadership Lounge. And one part of leadership is, is leading yourself. And the world is changing. And the way we lead ourselves is changing too. And one thing that now we have to worry about is our personal brand, both online and in person. And, and so we're going to dive into that today uh, with a special guest. So without any further ado, uh, Dr. Anima Kareem again is here as is Coach Jim Johnson, just like every week here in the lounge. So Coach, uh, could you introduce today our special guest and uh, let's get going on our discussion today. Sure. So really excited to welcome Frank Furness. Uh, I'm going to uh, read his bio in just a minute, but I had the pleasure to meet Frank at a national speakers conference, although he uh, travels the world a lot. Uh, and uh, right now, Frank, you're in the UK, right? Yeah, I split my time between Spain, the UK and Florida. So right now, okay. uh, yeah, for the summer. Yeah, OK. Nice. So, so, sounds great. And uh, I'd like to uh, share uh, as I said, I had the pleasure to meet Frank at a national speakers conference. Uh, he actually did a little video on, uh, about me uh, back in the day. So that, that was fun. And I've stayed in touch with Frank and we're really excited. So let me share. Uh, Frank's got quite a resume. So let me uh, read it off for you. From his early years as a successful drummer, backing the world's top acts, rising to the top 1% of salespeople worldwide. Frank Furness has emerged as a top global keynote speaker, sales specialist, tech, social media, and goal setting to produce stellar results for entrepreneurs and organizations around the world. He currently spends 70% of his time speaking internationally, working in 69 countries. Can't even fathom that, Frank. Mm -hmm. He's a specialist in sales, technology, social media, and goal setting, and how they work in tandem to produce great results for organizations. In 2007, he was awarded the top speaker for Vistage, the world's largest CEO organization. Europe, and in 2011, inducted in the Speaker Hall of Fame. In 2013, he was recognized as an overnight overseas speaker of the year for TEC Australia and rated top speaker for Vistage Florida. Since the COVID lockdown, and this has been a real positive, Frank has pivoted his business. He has created nine online courses for businesses through his webinars, has sold hundreds of courses since launching. He is also coaching and consulting with individuals and businesses globally on how to sell more and present effectively remotely, remotely using Zoom and other platforms. As a specialist on LinkedIn and YouTube, he also helps businesses discover, connect, and sell more using these platforms. Frank's books, Walking with Tigers, Success Secrets of the World's Top Business Leaders, and How to Find New Business and Clients are international bestsellers. Wow, that was impressive, Frank. We're really excited to have you. And uh, as you know, we our focus is helping young and emerging leaders. And we're going to really, you know, zero in on some of your real strengths in sales and, and marketing and social media and that. But I am going to throw you a curveball uh, because your bio stuck out at the beginning that you were an elite drummer. So I, I my curiosity has struck me. Uh, tell us a little bit about two things. One, what were some of the uh, bands that you worked with as a drummer? And two, how did you make the transition from being a top drummer to uh, being a, one of the top sales and marketing uh, speakers in the world? Well, you can see I still got all my drums behind me. I yeah? that. So uh, awesome. as soon as I have a break, I go and play my drums there. Uh, but I come from a, a blue collar family. And uh, when I was at school, uh, we were pretty average. In fact, most of my teachers told me I would never amount to anything because I was playing drums in a band there. 
And when I left school, my mom decided I was going to be the first person to get a degree. I was going to become an accountant. Uh, after 10 months, they fired me. I was the most disruptive employee they ever had. And then I became a professional rock drummer. I did that for 10 years and got married. And I had to get a real job there because you don't stay married as a rock drummer. I can tell you that. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I couldn't get any kind of job except selling insurance, life insurance. I got into that. And uh, straight away became really successful at that. Uh, 1993, we moved over to London. I started a firm over here. And within four years, I was amongst the top salespeople in the whole of the UK. And people started asking me to come and speak at their conferences. And then someone offered to pay me. And I thought, oh, this is better than selling. I'm going to go and speak all over the world. And that was the transition from drumming into, uh, you know, getting into sales and speaking at conferences all over. Wow. Okay. So you, you drum, you speak in 69 countries, you have your courses, you um, also specialize in sales and marketing. What do you do in all your free time then? <laughs> well, I, most of my time is free time now. So like uh, Jim, what I do is I play a lot of tennis. There's a Spanish game called paddle. There's a game called pickleball, weird game. Oh, so yeah. at least four <laughs> to five times a week, I'm playing those games. Uh, and then I fit my work around that now. In the old days, I used to work and fit my sport around it. Now I've changed uh -huh. that around. Mm -hmm. I have sport, I have social life. I take off at least six months a year. And I just sold my home in London last year. And I bought a place right on the beach now in Norfolk. So I wake mm -hmm. up looking at the sea. And for me, my business is a lifestyle business. Uh, mm -hmm. I want to go out there. Uh, we don't know how long we've got left to live. So I'm just enjoying every minute of every day. And then around that, fitting in the courses. I mean, just before our call now, it's, it's 2 p.m. In, uh, in, in the UK right now. I'm just busy putting together my next course, which is going to be for professional speakers. And mm. I was working on that. So um, I like to also make money while I sleep. So if I wake up 10 people who bought courses, hey, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Now I can go <laughs> play tennis some more, you know. Yeah. And Frank, it's so true that the lifestyle now uh, at this stage of our life, often we are looking for a better life, uh, a balanced life. So I was wondering, like, how did the definition of success change for you when you were from young to uh, this age? So you're still young and you're a young man. with. Uh, so how is success defined by uh, you at this stage of life? And how would you compare uh, like defining success when you were at the earlier stage of life? So I'm just interested and curious. I think when you're younger, success means uh, things, you know, making money, buying the nice cars, traveling, doing all of that stuff. For me now, success is just really enjoying life, spending time with family, friends, traveling all over the world, doing the quality kind of things that I'm doing. You know, I don't care if somebody's got a better car than me or got a better house than me. I know I've got the best lifestyle in the world for me, right. you know. Right. And I remember years ago, I've, I've still got it on my wall here. Paul J. Meyer said um, mm -hmm. what success was, the progressive realization of you reaching your own personal goals. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what it is. You're not trying to compete against anyone else. True. Um, I, I work with some of the Olympians, and I love a thing that they have, which is called personal best. You're never competing against anyone else. You're just trying to be the best you that you can be. Right. Very really good. So true. Hey, Frank, a uh, well, uh, little promise on the side before my next question. You know, being an avid tennis player, when we connect again, I have a former player that lives in London. So if I get out there, uh, we're going to get on the tennis court. I, I can promise you that. Or if I connect with you sometime in Florida. Well, I'm, I'm curious, you know, when you said you went from, you know, being a high level driller and then got into selling. Well, selling is so important in leadership. Can you tell us some tips because you ended up excelling in it. What did you learn to help you become an effective salesperson? I think the first thing, I, I had a great, great boss, and he forced me to buy a course on goal setting. I'd, I'd been a drummer, never had any goals before. But all of a sudden, I realized that if you put in the work, you could achieve anything you wanted to. And I started writing down goals and what I wanted to achieve. So that's the first thing I'd say to young people is have some goals. I realized now, even as a drummer, I'd set goals for myself because I wanted to be the best drummer in South Africa. And to do that, when I was 14 years old and I got my first set of drums, I couldn't afford drum lessons, but I found the best drummer in South Africa, knocked on his door and said, I can't afford you, but I need you to teach me. And uh, 
He said, I'll do it, but you don't touch drums for the first year. All you do is learn basics, rudiments, get the basics right. And that's what I did. I practiced for two hours every day. So that's another thing for the youngsters is get the basics right in whatever you're going to do, whatever profession you go into, and just practice, practice, practice. I've got a great friend, uh, Freddie Ravel, who was a keyboard player for Santana and Earth, Wind and Fire. He's worked with some of the best people in the world. And he said when he was practicing piano, he built a shed outside, put his piano in, and just practiced for 12 hours a day. Mm-hmm. So going for any youngsters, set yourself a goal, and then just keep practicing. It doesn't come overnight. I want to tell you, it takes a long time yeah. to reach success. Jim, you know that with all of your basketball. Yeah. Absolutely. And part of that yeah. is, is passion, too. It's got to be because you talk 12 hours a day playing the piano or for you two hours a day as a very young kid. Um, not a lot of people have that drive and that passion for, for that, whatever it is that they're doing. How do you find that within yourself that, Oh, this is what I'm passionate about. And this is the direction I should follow. And, and sometimes you've got to do the things that you don't like doing. Believe me, sitting for two hours, just practicing rudiments. It's not the biggest fun thing you can do. Practicing yeah. scales, practicing on a, it's The fun part is out when you're in front of an audience playing. That's mm-hmm. great. But before you can get there, you've got to pay the price. And it's yeah. like any sport, anything you're doing, you pay the price before you get there. That's yeah, and determination. Yeah. Uh, determination oh, is so important. And one of the interview with Kobe Bryant, he was saying that uh, while the other players are practicing at 6 a.m. in the morning, he is there at 4 a.m. in the morning. So he's going to get like two hours extra practice. And because he's putting that extra hour, he's know that he knows that he's going to be the best. So that determination of how many hours I'm putting. So it's not easy. But you have to do what you have to do. Uh, so from your perspective, you've been the one person of the top salespeople in the world. So piggybacking on Coach Jim Johnson's uh, question, uh, if uh, you, are, you were to advise like three top things uh, a young person should focus on while they're going for a sales pitch uh, or marketing a product, what are the top three things you Uh, you believe is important for them to focus on? Okay, I'm going to give you four things over here. If you want to make make cash, it's the cash formula. Mm -hmm. Um, K in cash is knowledge. You've got to have the knowledge. You've got to go out there, learn as much as you can about your product, your service, the competition, everything out there. That's the K. A is the most important, which is your attitude. And I remember when I got into sales, it was my attitude that determined my aptitude. Uh, The S is, of course, learning the skills and practicing the skills. And I remember when I got into insurance, I went and I found the top sales guy in the company. And I said, can I learn from you? And he said, sit in my office, shut up and just watch and learn. And that's what I did. You've got to develop the skills. And the H, of course, is the habits. You've just got to keep doing the same things all the time. You look at every top sportsman, every top salesperson, they've got those same kind of habits. First thing in the morning, doing the extra thing. Uh, you know, uh, David Beckham used to stay an hour or two after everybody else and practice his, his kicks. And that's why he was a great, great scorer of goals. Mm. So the cash formula is what I would say would work for anyone. Oh, true. So important. Hey, uh, Frank, you know, we talk uh a lot about leading yourself and you brought up the H word habits. Can you share maybe some habits that you do or you observed of high achievers that they consistently do that, uh, uh, that other people aren't doing consistently? I, I think what was good for me was we had to do compulsory military training and that instilled some of the kind of basic habits in me of like, I was listening to a thing the other day, from a top military guy. And he would say, develop the habit of making up your bed because it Mm. puts you in the frame for the rest of the day. And that's what we had to do in the army. I mean, before inspection, we would sleep under the bed, but those, those creases were ironed out the day before. And uh, even now people think I'm crazy when they come into my house. It's like, that's a military bed, but you get into those habits. And once you start developing those kinds of habits, then it's easy to get into other habits. When I got into selling, um, my, my boss said to me, you get into the office eight o'clock in the morning. This is the eighties. You get onto the phone, you cold call for two hours. People will swear at you. They'll put on the phone, but the law of averages says four people will say every day, come and see me. Uh, mm. You know, sometimes it's going to be the first four. Sometimes it's going to be the last four. 
Right. And that's what I would do. Everybody else would be at the coffee machine talking about how bad things were and what happened on the weekend. I would just get in their phone. And I think that's what made me a top sales guy, just develop the habits of what you have to do uh, on a daily basis. When I work with the Olympians as well, the same kind of thing. They have those exact same kind of habits. And some of the habits aren't great for them. You know, they've got to get up four o'clock in the morning, go and row on an icy river, do the things that they actually hate doing or when I work with the rowers, uh, they have one thing that they've got to practice. That I think it's called the ergo or something where they get in and they row for five minutes until they physically are sick. They get up and they run and they get sick. But that gets them into the frame of mind. When they're in that race, your body just cuts out and that hits in and gets you going for the rest of the time. So mm. it's whatever job you're in and, and as a youngster, find out what is it that makes you successful and develop those habits, even if you don't like them, but they are the ones that are going to get you where you want to be. It's a habit yeah. of developing habits, really. Yeah, absolutely. Now, Frank, I'm curious if, if we could shift gears a little bit here to your courses that you that you um, teach and have created. So now, are those courses mostly directed towards salespeople, toward, towards business people? Could you talk a little bit about that and, and what has been the most rewarding thing for you in uh, not as much selling, but now more directing that towards teaching others how to sell? So a lot of it is towards business people. Um, I've got one. In fact, I'm redoing my whole course on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is the hottest thing right now. And I'd mm -hmm. say to everybody, you've got to be on LinkedIn. And I'm, I'm pretty good on LinkedIn. I've got about 32,000 followers. Yeah. I get up to 50,000 views when I put a post up there. Pretty good. <laughs> yeah. I, I drive sales from there. And, and I think if you're going to put a course out there, you've got to prove what you're doing. So I've got the LinkedIn course. I've got a thousand videos on YouTube, um, millions of views. So again, I've got a whole course on video production like you're doing there, John, and, uh, and also how to make it work. Um, my other courses are how to make money while you sleep, of course, which is how to create courses to make money. Uh, I've got one. I've got the biggest course in the world for financial advisors. Having been a financial advisor, I, I know everything about the business so I have the hugest, I don't know, it must be about 100 videos on the course out there. Okay. Wow. And the next one, like Jim, I've been a professional speaker for 20 years. And uh, so I'm making a course for professional speakers. So I, I find what is my expertise firstly, who's my target audience, and then I put together the course for them. But you can have the best course in the world. If you don't know how to market it, you're dead. It's going to sit there and nobody's going to be buying it. So then comes the constant marketing and driving of traffic. And that's where social media drives them to buy your course. Oh. And while uh, you're talking about social media, uh, I, we are, we are like observing this world around us is now moving with the social media. And uh, it was interesting. I'm, uh, I, I'm often talking about the Ukrainian war and everything. But it was shown that the, the President Zelensky, he wasn't a political person, but he used the social media in a way, in such a way to attract the young voters that instead of a, uh, like a seasoned politician, he was the one who got voted. Um, so for, uh, but again, social media is also a distraction, often not giving us the right message. So how do you, how do you think a leader or a salesperson or anybody who wants to sell their product in the social media can work towards getting that integrity or trust? How important is building trust through social media? Can social media do that, uh, building trust? Okay, so firstly, you have to find out who your target audience is, and then you've got to get in front of that target audience. So if you're a CEO of a tech company, chances are you're not going to try and get your message out on Facebook because your followers aren't going to be there. They're mm. going to be on LinkedIn. So the first thing is, where are your followers? You've got to hang out where they hang out. Right. Second thing is, nowadays, so many people, especially the younger people, Businesses are all very similar, selling different, you know, similar products and services. Mm -hmm. What's going to differentiate you is your leader. So mm -hmm. people do want to find out about that leader. What is his culture? What is his style? How does he treat all of his staff? And so two things there, I'd say you've got to get into making videos. When I work with leaders all over the world, I say you've got to do things like uh, meet the CEO. They want to know you in a personal way. They want to get to know the man or the woman behind that brand. If you look at somebody like Branson, 
you know, he's got Virgin and then he's got the personal brand. He mm. is that brand and he works really hard at maintaining that. He's on videos, he's on LinkedIn, he's all over the place. Uh, and the second place to build your brand absolutely is on LinkedIn because mm. that's where most of your business followers are going to be following you. The challenge with a lot of leaders is getting them to actually do it because they all say, I'm so busy running my business, I don't have time to do all of this LinkedIn stuff. But you've got to make the time. That's part of your brand is mm. people do want to know who you are, how you work, and why should we why should we buy from you rather right. than anyone else? What is it that makes you unique or different? True. And I agree. Like now everybody wants to go in and check your LinkedIn profile. And if you do not have one, then you're not in the game. So mm. it how, is so absolutely. crucial. Yeah, absolutely. LinkedIn is definitely the place. As I say this morning, I've just been recording and, and thinking about some of the people that I'm working with. And I mean, some of the other leaders I'm working with, I've got, I've got another company that I work with in the US. And they what they do, they have a washable mouse and keyboard. Now, and you can imagine during the pandemic, every hospital, every event place has got to have that washable keyboard and that kind of thing. And right. he's got a hugely successful business. He has people that drives a business for him. He, he doesn't even have to be there. But mm. all of a sudden, he discovered personal branding in terms of a podcast, and he loves it. So every Wednesday now, he comes in and he does his podcast. And it's to a small audience because it's really technical people, maybe in the hospitality or the hospital kind of industry. You don't have to have the biggest audience in the world. But that target audience, he's picking up so much business because he's bringing on great guests and he's talking mm -hmm. about what he's the expert at. So mm -hmm. whether it's podcasting, whether it's video or LinkedIn, you've got to, as a leader, you've got to get your personal brand out there. So sometimes it's quality over quantity too, right? Because you have that quality of audience, then you convert a higher percentage of that audience. And that's a lot better than converting, you know, 1% of the, all the thousands of people you call, right? So there's, there's some of that too. Now, how about quality over quantity as far as relationships are concerned too? I mean, when in, in selling, when you need to, um, massage relationships for lack of better term, you need to keep relationships going to, to, um, to ensure that there are repeat buyers. Um, was that something that you specialized in as well throughout your career, as far as not just trying to generate new business, but but keeping that business coming back with those existing clients? Oh, absolutely. And I do it all the time because every time I meet someone, I try and get them to sign up for my subscriber list. Um, and then I put a newsletter out. You've got to be in front of people all the time. Otherwise, they're going to be forgetting about you. Mm -hmm. So I get my newsletter out. I have a Friday just social tips where people go in. There's stacks of social media tips. By the way, you can get, you know, franksocialmediatips.com. If you go on to that, you can subscribe. It's free. But so many times I'll send out that newsletter. In fact, I got a thing this morning from a guy that said, I saw you 13 years ago in Perth in Australia and I got your newsletter, it just reminded me of you. When are you coming out again? When can we do some work? Uh, another one I sent out to one of the offshore financial services companies, guy came back to me, he says, oh, you just reminded me, we've got some new salespeople in, can you come in and work with them? And another one I just got this morning from um, another company of mine in Malaysia that said, we're having our conference in Thailand in Phuket in June, can you come over? And it's just because I'm in front of them all the time, either by LinkedIn or by a newsletter and by Facebook and some of the other social media platforms. Top of mind, right? That's the, Top of mind. the term you 100%, John, yeah. yeah. Hey, Frank, I, I, I'm curious, uh, you know, uh, I've been a speaker uh, not quite as long as you, but been out there for quite a while. And the, uh, something that I believe leaders, one of my keys I talk about leadership is effective communication and certainly listening is a big part of that. But another part of that is the ability as a leader to inspire with words. Um, and I've, I've found a few times where I spoke to a company where the, the uh, CEO or one of the leaders has spoke before me and they're pretty bad, which is nice for me because it makes it easier <laughs> to come <laughs> after them. Uh, so, but I really believe as a leader, you've got to learn how to be a, a better public speaker. So what, uh, tips would you give someone that's into leadership that, uh, to help them become a better public speaker? Well, I think there's two things they have to do as a leader. The first thing is you've got to go on a media course and learn how to handle the media. I've seen so many people mm -hmm. that have absolutely messed up their company because they just 
have got no clue about how to do media. And the second thing is go on a communications or a coaching course on how to be a speaker. Um, I've worked with some incredible people. The, the, the best person I ever worked with was, this is an interesting story. Uh, I try all kinds of weird and wacky things and I did an email blast to CEOs in the Middle East and all of my friends laughed at me and said, it's not going to work. Well, the one thing that happened, I managed to get onto Dubai FM, which I'd been trying to do for years. And the other thing, it was picked up by somebody that phoned and said, we'd like you to come in and work with our leadership group. I said, yeah, that's great. And then they came back and they said, it's just one-on-one -on -one with our leader. I said, yeah, that's great. And then she came back and she said, we've checked you out, which means we've looked at your Facebook. There's no drunken pictures over there. We've checked out your <laughs> LinkedIn. We've done all of that. We're going to bring you on board. And she said, I haven't told you the whole truth. He's actually the crown prince of Abu Dhabi. Wow. Oh my and I, I ended up two days in the Royal Palace in Abu Dhabi. No one ever gets to be in there working one-on-one oh. -on -one with uh, the crown prince. And the best thing I did was at the end of the two days, I got a video testimonial. So please get video testimonials. Mm -hmm. Put that out there. Three or four months later, started getting calls from all over the Middle East. We saw you working with a crown prince. Can you come in and work with us? Now, there again is an example. The interesting thing about the crown prince at that stage was only 28 years old. And here's this young fellow because he's in the royal family. He's thrown into the deep end, CEO of one of the biggest companies. Soon after that, he had to go and speak to 500 world leaders. So they have to get in. And what they do, they bring people in and they train them and say, well, you need those skills. This is what you've got to do. Mm -hmm. And what you were saying there, Jim, is I think all of these leaders have got to get training in those two areas because you know what it's like. You follow somebody and they're hopeless and it could be great for you or the whole audience could fall asleep and half of them are left by the time you get on stage. <laughs> right. So true. And uh, this is so true. Like I've uh, heard a quote, like success is not owned, but it is rented. And every day you have to pay the rent for it. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, from uh, my, I'm curious, like, how do you keep that momentum going and uh, continuous learning? We are always talking about we need to grow every day. Uh, so how do you keep yourself uh, like uh, with the pace of trend and time? And how are you doing? How are you working on that continuous learning? For me, learning is a, it, it's a passion. I love it. I read at least five business books uh, a month. Um, and, and I think it's, I think if you're really interested in something, you're going to learn about it. Being a drummer, I, every day I'm watching drumming tactics. You know, I'm not a full-time drummer anymore, but I'm still watching what they're doing. Leaders, I go in, I watch videos on what leaders are doing. I read books on social media. I bought just about every course and every book on LinkedIn and YouTube. And most of them say the same kind of thing. But all I'm looking for is that one or two hidden gems that I didn't know about that's going to add to me because there's only so much you can learn about a topic, but if right. you can pick up something new. Um, and again, I got this from that same client in Kuala Lumpur. I used to go to his place and uh, he just had hundreds and hundreds of books. And he just says, they all say the same thing. I'm looking for one thing in a book that's going to make me better than my comp uh, competitor. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. I have a follow-up question to that, Frank, actually, um, because as someone I'm 23 and I'm just, I just graduated from, from Syracuse with a master's. Um, and I, I know a lot of people who are also, you would say highly educated as far as, you know, fr from a degree perspective, master's PhD. Um, and, and a lot of the attitude in that community, while certainly some of us feel like we're lifelong learners, but there's, there's also some attitude at, at times that, that feels a little bit like we've already learned it all. And since there's no place to go in academia, there's no more learning to be done. How is it, how, what would you say to those, to those individuals um, who, who feel that way, that, um, that lifelong learning ends in your 20s? I mean, what would you say to that? And, and how do you, your courses disprove that and actually continue learning no matter what age you're at? Well, it's like if you don't water a tree or a plant, it's going to die. You know, if it's not getting constantly fed and, and constantly growing, uh, nothing's going to happen there. And I would say to any youngsters now, never, ever stop learning. It was quite interesting because I'm doing a free webinar on LinkedIn on the 18th of May. And I look back at the course that I'm going to be promoting. And I was like, I did that course a year ago. So much has changed. And it's ended up like today, I'm totally redoing that course because in one year, 
There's been so many changes, and it's the same thing with YouTube and sales. I mean, sales has changed since uh, we've had the pandemic. Everything has gone on to Zoom. So there's no way anyone can say, I already know everything about this. It doesn't matter what subject you're into. There's always going to be new stuff and changes. And if you stop learning, you stop growing. Yeah. And some careers even, like they will, uh, they won't exist in 10 years. Things oh, yeah. that are popular now might not even be exist in within a few years. And businesses, who remembers a thing called Blockbuster? You know. Yeah. <laughs> I don't actually. Maybe that's <laughs> yeah, there we go. <laughs> but it wasn't that long ago, John. <laughs> wow. Well, I guess uh, time is relative, right? When you're when you're 23 um, and you're growing up in the digital age like I have, things are a lot different. But even within that digital age, there's been a vast amount of change um, from where it started when I was younger to now. Um, ridiculous amount of changes. You noted um, this remote, um, this whole remote movement that that we're seeing now too. Is that something that you you see continuing here um, in sales, or or do you feel that things will start to swing back towards uh, more in person um, importance? I think it's swinging back more to the in person. But businesses have changed massively. I just know you're in London. So many businesses have said, well, why do we need to be paying these absolute fortunes in rent when we're getting the same results working from home? You know, my son and daughter-in-law are both top lawyers. They work from home three days a week and two days they'll go into the office. So Mm -hmm. things have definitely changed since the uh, pandemic. Um, And again, it depends on the kind of business Uh, I I absolutely believe that we will still be working remotely for many years to come. I know so many businesses now that have just said we're just as effective, you know. But then again, there's new skills. You've got to learn to have the right kind of lighting. You've got to have the right kind of microphone. I've got a professional microphone here. There you go. Wow. I've got all the lights over here. (laughs) So, you know, got the twin screens. I've got everything set up, another light over there. So if you're going to do it, you've got to get all of the right kind of tools. Right now, I'm showing my drums, but other times I put a green screen on the the chair behind me, and then I can drop in any background. I see so many people, and they they go onto Zoom, they don't have the right kind of lighting, and they become sort of blurry, and that's (laughs) off-putting straight away when they become like that. Mm. So, again, that's a whole lot of new skills that we have to learn. True. And uh, Frank, uh, you're doing so many things, like you're working on books, uh, courses, and all those things. How you do you schedule them? Like, what is your method of putting everything? You're traveling so much, you're speaking. So what is your method of, uh, like, be keeping that balance? Like, how do you schedule? Like, what is your technique? That's quite a hard one because I'm quite a creative <laughs> guy and I'm, I'm best when I'm in creative mode. You know, once okay. I've done something, it's like, okay, go forget about it. Like, I have all <laughs> of these courses and I'm thinking today, I've got to start promoting those again. I've taken all of the time to create them, but I'm always thinking of new things. I've got three books that I want to do, and I've got all kinds of ideas. So I always have to almost pull my rein myself in and mm. say, okay, what, what do you want to do now? What do you actually want to achieve? Let's work on that. Get that done. Because I get distracted so easily. I don't know if anyone <laughs> else is like me. Start off something. Yeah. And then I'm over there. And then I'm Oh, all yeah. Over that's me. Like, I want to do so many things. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And yeah. as you know, it, you've got to rein yourself in. And, and it's almost that self-discipline and habits. You know, I was out of bed at six this morning. What I try and do now, go to gym at six in the morning, come back. And that sets me up. The habit sets me up for the rest right. of the day. Because mm. it's so easy, just you know, I can lie and I work from home. I can lie until eight o'clock if I want to. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, like what you were saying there, Dr. Kareem, it's, it's you, you've got to pull yourself in, especially if you've got a personality like mine, you know, that's mm. all over the place. So now I wanted to do all kinds of stuff today, but I'm saying get that LinkedIn course finished. Don't do anything else because sometimes the things you've got to do are hard. They're not that fun. True. And it's like, why do I have to do this all over again? I've already got one, but it's it's old. Right, you know, and, and it's, it's so tough. Yeah, it's interesting you said uh, hard because uh, we all have this challenge. In fact, I, I do a success thought every day. And my success thought today is that things that are tend to be most difficult in your life are usually the most rewarding. Uh, and uh, that what I got to keep that mantra going because sometimes you want to avoid, uh, you know, doing the hard things that end up having a lot of benefit for you. 
Um, I'm curious, I know you brought up Richard Branson and we've talked, dabbled a little bit, but I'd like to delve in just a little deeper. Can you share some thoughts on building your own personal brand? Yeah, again, there, I think the first thing you've got to do is you've got to get a great LinkedIn profile. Um, you know, even if your team is going to be doing it for you, I'm sure Richard, Brandon's, uh, Richard Branson's not doing all of his own stuff. He's got a whole team behind him that are putting out the posts there. He's most probably just directing them and taking a look at all of that. But he's, he's got to be behind it. He's got to take ownership for it. And some of the times, the comments, he's got to be getting onto that there. If I look at bad leadership, we have an airline in the UK, yeah, British Airways, and they're absolutely hopeless. Um, they've got a terrible leader. He hides behind a cloud, never comes up, has got no personal brown, a brand, and, and the airline is hopeless. And if you look at some of the other airlines and places, uh, I actually, my post this morning on LinkedIn was all about Emirates Airline. Because for me, one of the greatest leaders in the world is um, Sheikh Maktoum in Dubai who many years ago said, we don't have oil here. We've got to create the best tourist paradise in the world. And every time I go there, I'm absolutely blown away by what they're doing because he's constantly thinking, he's constantly got this team around him of saying, what, we, what can we do to be bigger and better? Because I don't think you can ever stop growing as a leader. There's always got to be that thing, what do I do next? And how do I get a great team around me? You're not going to do it on your own. Right. So how do I get the best team to be working with me to create that? So your question there, Jim, is, you know, have that LinkedIn profile, have meet the team, do all of the things that lets people see you as the actual person. Mm. Uh, Frank, I got to delve in one more because uh, teams obviously strike a chord uh, being a coach of teams for many years. Give me uh, your thoughts on what you look for to bring people onto a team you work with. So this is quite interesting because um, my partner and I about 10 years ago started another insurance company in, in England and uh, he ran the whole business. I would just go in, I, I helped him set it up, I helped him to recruit. And what we did is in the beginning, our recruitment strategy was the breathing strategy. If they could breathe, we would recruit them and take <laughs> them on board. <laughs> And then after about a year, we realized we had a massive sales force, but only about 10% of them were producing anything. So we got rid of all of those. And we looked at what was the profile that worked for us. The first thing we did when we started was we tried to be all over the UK. We then realized we we're in North London. Let's just stick to North London. There's more than enough business there. We then looked at who were the most successful people working for us. They were 23 to 33-year-olds. Older guys like me were burnt out. They didn't want to do what they had to do. So we took on, on board that that was going to be the profile of the youngsters. And then I had to convince my partner, who was an old style leader, you've got to be in the office 6.30 in the morning. You've got to work till 6.30 at night. I'm like, you've got a 23 to 33 year old. There's no way in the world they're going to be doing that. They'll work their own hours. They want recognition. So I would go in once a month and I would take them out. We'd have a team building exercise. We'd go play tennis. We'd do something. They love that over there. I got to know them really personally. And we had no hours. But the thing was, we had leads coming in all the time. If you weren't in the office, you didn't get the lead. You didn't get the sales. So naturally, they were in early. They would be working Saturdays and Sundays. So we created the right kind of environment. But for your team, find out what works for you and in your business. Frank, as we're wrapping up here, you've shared some great wisdom, but I know there are a lot of ways that we can actually learn even more from you. Um, and, and those include your courses, your social media. What is the best way to, to get signed up for those courses or to, to um, follow you on social media and uh, learn, learn more of your wisdom? So three places, if you just go to Linktree, I don't know if you've heard of Linktree, link.tree forward slash Frank Furness. That's got all of my social media profiles. Uh, my normal website is frankfurness.com. And all of my courses are on productivitycenter.com, C-E-N-T-R-E. -E. So the English spelling, productivitycenter.com. Okay. And great. if anyone wants to get in contact, please feel free, frank at frankfurness.com. Okay. All right. That's um, a lot of, of different ways you can get in contact with Frank and they will all be in the show notes too. So scroll down to those show notes and uh, 
find whatever works best for you. I like Linktree a lot because instead of, you know, going on Instagram, going on to Facebook, going on to LinkedIn, it's, it's all right there. And we all know that, that those profiles on all of these relevant platforms, it's important to have because, you know, you have a slightly different audience on each, but it's important to be present on all of them. So Frank, your, your wisdom is much appreciated today. Uh, thank you so much for joining us on the Limitless Leadership Lounge. Thank you. Thank you for joining us this week at the Limitless Leadership Lounge. To listen to this episode again and to find previous episodes, check us out on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Spreaker. You can also get in on the conversation. Find us on Facebook and Instagram. Then tell three of your friends to join in as well. Coach, Renuma, and John will be back again next week for another tri-generational leadership discussion. We'll talk to you then on the Limitless Leadership Lounge.